everyone. Welcome back to another episode of WinFitCharge. My name is Sanika Rahul Sabdekar and I'm the co-head of marketing. Uh, with us today, I have Ms. Leslie Yartman. Hi, ma'am. How are you? Um, very good. How are you? Thank you. Uh, just so for our viewers, uh, Ms. Yartman is a filmmaker and actress and also the director of the documentary that we're about to discuss today, India's Daughter. Uh, so uh, India's Daughter is very famous, as you all know, it's been screened at several film, uh, film festivals and uh, notably, uh, you also won the Peabody Award for it, right? That's right. And you should always mention that it is still banned in India. It is still banned in India. Um, I did end up watching the documentary when I was in the UK myself. But it's, it's a shame that it is banned in India. And that kind of brings me to my first question. Uh, now that we have five years post the release of the documentary, do you think uh, if you were to release it in 2020, the Indian populace would react the same way as they did in 2015? Would they have the same fate, are you asking? Would the documentary have the same fate? That is, do you think they'd still end up banning it in 2020? Of course, of course. I mean, nothing has changed in these intervening years. Absolutely nothing has changed for women or girls. In fact, if anything, it gets worse. Why does it get worse? It gets worse because people become inured to violence. Uh, you stop having the same shock value. You need more and more extreme cases to shock you once you've been shocked by intestines being pulled out of the body. What, what's to shock you next? Do you, do you know what I'm saying? It becomes normalized. This is the problem that unless you tackle discrimination, which is what violence against women is all about, unless you tackle the mindset and change that mindset, you're going to get nowhere. And it's the same racial discrimination. Um, you look at the Black Lives Matters protests and uh, we're going to be seeing the same protests in 10 years time and in 20 years time, unless we start now to systemically change mindset because racism is embedded and entrenched just as discrimination against women and girls is. And let me tell you that no protest movement, no matter how thrilling and beautiful and courageous, uh, no hashtag campaign will ever change things. And we are naive and stupid if we think that that is how we get change. So, uh, yeah, of course it would receive the same fate because the mindset hasn't changed. So, uh, people in India will still be looking at this film saying, oh my goodness, it shows us in a bad light. We better get rid of it. Well, you know, <laughs> that's very naive. You don't get rid of a film in a digital era by banning it. By banning it, you actually excite people to want to watch it. Um, That's true. That is true. And um, I think what's happened with India's Daughter in particular is that it's become pirated over so many sites that no one even knows unless you actually go watch the real thing, how the documentary was made and what purpose it intended to serve, which I think is a shame. Uh, but I did notice you talking about uh, attitudes towards women and girls. Um, and I had a simple question. So when I did end up watching India's Daughter, um, I noticed how some of the people, uh, particularly the de defense for the accused, shared kind of the same mindset uh, that the accused shared. And in fact, I'd go out on a limb to say that most Indian men shared. Do you think that's changed over the past five years or even eight years since the rape happened? Not at all. Why would it change? What has actually happened to change that? I mean, you're right. That is the most shocking thing, I'd say, in the documentary. And why? Because we naturally assume that the more educated men would not be uh, uh, sharing those same misogynies and, and hyper-discriminations. But look at Harvey Weinstein. Look yeah. at Donald Trump. They are not uneducated men from slums. And we make a huge mistake if we think that it is those who are of a, a, a disadvantaged background or those who lack education. In fact, this was the whole point of the documentary for me and the biggest insight I got. The understanding that it's the mindset 
that is the disease we're dealing with here. It's not the violence. The violence is the symptom of the disease. The disease itself is the mindset of discrimination. Now, how do you change a mindset? There's only one way to change mindset, education. But it sure as hell is not the kind of education those lawyers or Harvey Weinstein or Donald Trump enjoyed, right? They did have the highest degree of access to education, but that education is a broken system, not fit for purpose. It's an education that was designed in and for the Industrial Revolution. It's outmoded, antiquated, and all it teaches our children is to join factories. That's what it was designed for. It teaches our children to go into the labor market. That's, that's its purpose. It has nothing to do with creating and nurturing a decent, dignified human being who respects the dignity and decency of others, who is empathetic, who uh, learns to love and take care of our common earth, a uh, uh, home of the earth, who uh, learns to lead healthy relationships or value other people. That is the missing piece. That is the missing dimension to education. And that is why I've left filmmaking behind after this film. India's Daughter was my very last film I'll ever make because I understood the problem so absolutely clearly from this privileged journey I had of being able to interview not just the rapists in their prison cells, but the lawyers um, and others in, in, in that society who prove that discrimination, the women are also uh, uh, programmed, right? They're all robotically programmed and it's culture that programs us. And you can even have as many kind of legal changes and new laws enacted as you like. Culture trumps law. So there is nothing but mindset change and cultural change, which is the same thing. Nothing else will move it forward. That's it, full stop. That's, that, that kind of ties in with the point because uh, I see how uh, they had a Nirbhaya law that came out after um, the rape where uh, minors who have committed heinous crimes can be convicted. But I don't see that making any change. Uh, just yesterday, a tribal girl from uh, Orissa got, uh, came out with this terrible, terrible rape accusation. And there's just so many silos of, um, you know, dynamics that come into play, like caste, gender, and it's just not going to change till we change our culture. But- uh, also, also, quite importantly, Sanika, this whole question of, you know, this case having brought about um, uh, death penalty for rape, this actually changed the quantum of punishment for rape. Now, when I sat with the rapists and asked, so this is going to deter people now, right? Because they know if they, if they rape, they can get hanged. And I was met with this response, with a smile on the face saying, <laughs> now they'll just kill the girls after they rape them so that we can't be identified. I that is the response. I promise you that is the reality. Because if you disrespect someone to such a degree that you can inflict brutal and horrible pain and attack them in this way, well, you don't respect that life at all. So what's the difference between going one step further, putting your hands around that neck and snapping it? What's the difference? You know, it's just one further step. So that, I promise you, if anybody's been watching since the death, not the death penalty was carried out, but since the death sentence was meted out, which was, I believe in, was it September 2013? Um, it, it, whenever that was, it's years ago, right? I hope somebody's been recording the number of rape murders that there have been since that point in India. I would say that almost all mainstream rapes that come out in the newspapers do end with murder these days. That's, I did not notice that till you just pointed it out, but it is true. Uh, but that kind of brings me to another question that I had, which is um, there's an increasing call in India and I think across the world to abolish death penalty. What do you think? Do you think death penalty solves uh, the situation at hand? What do you think could be an appropriate punishment for uh, people who rape women on the daily? Death penalty solves nothing. 
death penalty is a mirage. In fact, it's pretty dangerous for the issue and problem itself because what death penalty does is it pushes the line that these men are in the minority, they are rotten apples in the barrel, and once you get rid of them, you're actually culling uh, and diminishing the problem. This is absolute rubbish. I mean, one in three women are abused. They are either sexually uh, assaulted or raped or have, um, uh, you know, uh, physical violence meted out to them. Um, one in three women. That's not a few rotten apples in a barrel, right? Yeah. It's the barrel that's rotten. It's the, and it's we who program those men to think as they think and therefore to act on those thoughts. So the bottom line is what death penalty does is remove us from the equation when we should be front and center in the spotlight. We bear a responsibility and a culpability in all the rapes, in all the rape murders, because we've taught our boys to think that women are second class citizens. We have taught them that our sisters should wait to eat last at the table because we, the boys, need to be honored in some way or we, or we get the full glass of milk because we need our strength and they get the half glass. They are destined to water our neighbor's garden, you know, to be serving their in-laws and husbands and they are a burden to us, which is why many of them don't even survive into life. So, you know, with a culture like that, and, and listen, we have to remove any question that this is peculiar to India or India-centric, not in any way. At the end of this film, India's Daughter, you will see a roll call of statistics of the US, of Canada, of Australia, of the UK, of Denmark. There is no country in the world that has got this right. And it's only a question of differing degrees and expressions. So let's be clear about that. And let's remove this ridiculous, childish, immature sense of shame. I don't want you to say these things about my country. Nationalism is nothing in the face of the kind of derision that we see for women and girls, for people of color, for certain religions. And it's the same motive. This isn't just about gender, I have to tell you. Caste, what about caste? I mean, how can a country hold its head up high in the world today when it has a caste system that is disgraceful and disgusting? This is apartheid by any other name. The world did get together as far as South Africa was concerned and say, this is not acceptable. You cannot have apartheid that diminishes the value of a whole population uh, um, sector because of the color of their skin. Well, it's the same thing with caste. You cannot diminish the value, you know, and devalue a whole sector of your population because they happen to have been born in a particular caste. This is insane and unacceptable and evil and should be called out. Absolutely. And also, I, I think that um, even when uh, people face punishment as such, most people who end up going to jail, according to statistics, are men uh, or women from these oppressed uh, castes. And the women who end up bearing the brunt of oppression are also women from these oppressed castes. But truly, those who get free are the upper castes. So I think um, even with the whole uh, Nirbhaya situation, um, I think the only reason it became such a big deal was that um, uh, that you know most rape cases in India do end up getting desensitized. It, it just becomes another column in the newspaper for us as such. But why it really yeah. became important was that a girl like Jyoti, who you know been to medical school, was almost about to graduate, was you know uh, inflicted with so much torture by these men, and it also took on that anger, won't you say? Yeah, but you know, many people thought that she was, you know, from the, the sort of lower middle classes. Far from it. Her father worked as a porter at the airport. They were mind-blowingly poor. I mean, she was as poor as those rapists were. So, you know, I think, I think the fact that, you know, JNU, the students came out, they were the first to come out onto the streets, and somehow it was that drop of water that broke the damn wall. 
because it could have been any number of cases, right? Um, but, you know, just back to your question about death penalty. I mean, I'm less interested in punishment, frankly. We should be punished for teaching our children to think that way, if you're really, you know, considering who, who deserves punishment. I'm only interested in rooting out the cause. It's time. How many more decades are we going to see people having to take to the streets to protest? Protest, which changes nothing, but is an outcry, a beautiful outcry of the soul, of collective humanity saying, enough, we don't want this anymore. Well, if you don't want it, do something about it. And what there is to do about it is what I'm now devoting the rest of my life to. That's my solution. I'm sure other people have theirs. My solution is you start with children between the ages of three and six. Because that is when the character's formed. That is when the moral compass is set. And by the age of six, you can influence a human being to have a, a, a hard wiring in the physical architecture of the brain that is empathetic, that loves rather than hates, that sees us all as absolutely equal. We're just different shades or different faiths or different ethnicities. We're all different but equal and we celebrate our differences. And, you, you know, we in Think Equal teach children between these ages, we don't spend our energy because we're a very small organization. We don't have capacity, so we don't spend our energy beyond the age of six. Because in neuroscientific terms, there are certain trajectories of activity in the brain which flatline at the age of six. And they are emotional control and habitual ways of responding. And think about how key those are in the later perpetration of violence. So if you, by the age of six, can create with your kids together, co-constructed learning, neuropathways that can control impulses, that can control emotions, and whose habitual way of responding is positive rather than negative, pro-social rather than anti-social. If you want to share something with me and I don't want to share it with you, instead of hitting you and grabbing it back, I reason with you and I say, please, will you wait because I want to use this first. So we teach them critical thinking. We teach them um, problem solving. We teach them emotional literacy, gender equality, etc. 25 competencies and skills. And our children are turned around. And the cost of this program is $2 per child. It's ridiculously cheap. And in fact, anybody listening, go onto the Think Equal website and donate however much you can for however many children you can. That is something you can do because that is active. That is practical. That means X number of children get this program. That is, and I'm going to request all the viewers to please go out and check um, uh, the website, Think Equal, and uh, read into what they do, because I think it's so important um, to shape the future of our countries, all of our countries, not just India or the UK, and make them responsible people, people who respect all, uh, you know, religions, genders, races, just think of them as equals. But uh, would you then right. say that Think Equal is a direct product of all the research that you did into, uh, you know, the Nirbhaya incident? 100%. The one totally led into the other. It was the insights from that film that made me understand what was needed. And I went directly from the day that film released, which was the 8th of March, 2015, I got on a plane and went to New York uh, met up with Charles Ratcliffe, the head of global affairs for the UN Human Rights Commission, and started working on this program. And that is literally how it happened. And I stopped making films, and I have since that day completely and utterly devoted myself to this charity. And that's the way it will be till the day I die, because I know this is going to make all the difference. And we see it. We get stories back from the teachers about children who come in at three as racists and are turned around within three months, four months. Stories of kids who come in who are violent, a mother. I got one letter just last week and they come in, you know, we're with just nearly 40,000 children now. 
in 14 countries across five continents. So we're growing hugely. The country of Belize has just committed, we're about to go and train all their teachers uh, later this month. They've just committed to making Think Equal compulsory for every three to six year old child. And it's compulsory. Music literacy are compulsory. How, how can it not be compulsory relationships? This is absolutely key. Um, Sanika, you've frozen. I don't know if this is continuing to record or not. Did, did you have a problem there? Uh, no, the recording? a little bit, but I can hear yeah. you now. It's perfect. So, um, you know, so, so just to repeat that in case it was lost, the critical thing is if we deem uh, numeracy and literacy, learning how to read and how to count, and if we say that should be compulsory, then should it not be compulsory for us to learn how to lead healthy relationships? Absolutely. Should it not be compulsory? How to value another human being, right? And we can't leave it to the parents, which is what we naive, highly naive and harmful, because all the parents can do is cyclically and generationally pass down their discriminations to their children, which is how it just goes, you know, and then we become like hamsters on this uh, Ferris wheel. Um, but, you know, the bottom line also is that this program is totally, it's been designed prescriptively. You do not need to be a trained early years teacher in order to teach Think Equal. And why did we design it that way? Because the early years teaching have been treated like babysitters, underpaid, underrespected, undertrained. Because nobody has hitherto given the importance to early childhood education that it deserves. This is the very window of opportunity we have to lay foundations for positive outcomes in life. And we have a workforce that's pretty much around the world untrained. So we've designed the program prescriptively. We give books. Uh, narrative is critically important, I know as an ex-filmmaker, it's critically important for empathy. Empathy is the glue that sticks this all together, right? Um, so we, get, we have three levels. Each level is age appropriate. Three to four-year-olds have one level. Four to five-year-olds have another, and five to six-year-olds a third. And in each level, we have 30 weeks. It has to be sustained teaching, comprehensive. Three lessons a week of half an hour to 45 minutes each one book a week that floats the theme and we've created all the books ourselves so we don't have a single book with a woman at a sink uh, or a man with a briefcase in a suit we don't show the world as it is we show the world as it should be and we teach the children all about equality and inclusion um, and and generosity and compassion and empathy etc uh, and it's it's replicable because it's so concrete and easy. It's plug and play. So it's replicable and scalable. Um, and really, you know, the other thing is, and I know I made this impassioned appeal to anyone watching to, you know, give up a coffee a week, for heaven's sake. One coffee at Starbucks uh, teaches a child this program for a whole year. Um, but the other impassioned plea I want to make is help us start a movement. Quite apart from, you know, if you can't afford to give a cup of coffee a week and, 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 you know, free up the money for one child every week to get this program, by the way, by the end of the week, you would have two classrooms worth that you yourself founded. Putting that aside, if you can't do that, or you're not minded to do that, well, share with others. Try and get them to, you know, build a movement. We all need this. It's the only way we're going to solve things. Absolutely. And I think the way you were talking about the way the world should be, I mean, you just said you've been working in so many countries. Uh, was that 14? 14 countries, yes. Yeah. So I, I can all, all, already see that like around 14, you know, countries with their young children might, there might be a tangible change in their, you know, social fabric in the next 15 years. And that's what we're looking at. Well, right? we there will be, and I tell you, the other thing that's going to happen is in 15 years, these countries, the ones who, who do sort of sub reach a substantial saturation, of course, Belize, 100%. You watch Belize's GDP in 15 years' time. There's going to be a sudden massive rise in GDP 
And people are gonna wonder why. Well, the reason is that we have trained children to not commit acts of violence. So for example, that's just on one level, right? If you think in the UK, let's take UK statistics, because by the way, we, so our 14 countries include so-called developed countries. I don't think there's a single developed country, not morally developed on this earth, right? <laughs> I mean, maybe Belize, because they've got it. They're enlightened enough to know that this is the way forward. Yeah, uh, even to, to... Right. But um, we're in Australia, we're in Canada, we're in the UK, we're in the US, and we're in Sri Lanka and uh, South Africa and, um, you know, just many, many countries, North Macedonia, etc., Mexico, anyway. Um, the, am I losing my thread? What was I going to say, Seneca? Help me. Um, um, GDP, thank you very much. I was working out the statistics for the UK, um, or, or rather the, the cost benefit ratio as compared with the incarceration of one single offender. Now, it costs, a prison cell in the UK is probably the most expensive piece of re real estate per square meter in the country. Oh, it wow. costs an average of 5,000 pounds to incarcerate one violent offender in the UK for one year. Oh, wow. That must that be such a burden. Can you imagine this? That money could prevent violent offending in 22,500 children. Oh. Now, what kind of are we that we would rather spend 45,000 pounds a year on the violent offenders rather than spend that same amount on trying to stop violence and prevent it at its root in 22,500 children, even if we're only 10% successful, which of course I tell you we will not be. We will be much closer to the 100% successful. But let's assume the worst case scenario, we're preventing 10%. Well, we're saving nine times 45,000. I mean, <laughs> sorry, is anybody actually doing some maths? I think it's crazy it's, stuff. It's difficult for people to directly imagine putting it. Uh, it's easier to give it to one person in the cell than to give it to an entire society and then look for change because uh, change is like long and gradual. And I don't think most countries out there are willing to wait for the change. I mean, for most of us, we just want to see change like this. But uh, to in order to change, yeah, you know, it's, crime rates, it, it's, it's a long and gradual process, right? But it's our money. We are the taxpayers. Absolutely. We should rise up again. So that's not acceptable. I'm sorry, you're not going to unwisely use my tax money to pay for the incarceration of offenders because where is the victim in all of that? Where is the victim and survivor in all of that? We're not even thinking about that person and the hospital bills, right? It's that inhumane and it's no longer acceptable. In this day and age now, it is no longer acceptable to be sitting back and looking at systemic violence, systemic racism. We're not accepting it anymore. Look at the movement in America. Bless them for getting out there. But we have to go a step further. And, you know, all of those corporations, if anyone here has a, um, a parent, um, a father or a mother, of course, the mother would only be 9% of them because only 9% of women uh, are, are on boards of corporations, sadly, because of our discrimination. But, um, you know, if anyone listening has a mother or a father who is, for example, on the board of a corporation, challenge them. Say, look, it's simply not enough to put white lettering on a black square that says we stand in solidarity with. Don't stand in solidarity with, do something, act on it. Decide that you, your corporation, will actually uh, sponsor one town or one village or one district because we can turn this situation around and we must. And if politicians are too selfish to look at any kind of long-term view because they're just thinking about immediate results, you know, and changing things before their next election, 
we shouldn't allow that. These are elected representatives. They must do as we want them to do. It's quite simple. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think we as the people are, as much as we're responsible, we're also capable of making the change in the world themselves. Like yeah. if we've created the rapist, we also have the ability to, you know, take away those irrational thoughts from his head or and make make sure he's a responsible individual. Um, so my as next long question... As, early, as long as we start early, Sanika, that has Absolutely. to be borne in mind because after sex, we can change, but then we have to throw trillions of dollars at it because we have to undo the bad habits and the bad wiring and we have to send them to rehabilitation, we have to send them to therapy. Why do that? Why take the expensive and long route rather than just prevent? You're right. And um, that's why I really like the work you do with Think Equal. Um, you're, you're like presenting a tangible solution to peoples of countries and saying, this is what you can do to rid yourself of this evil that exists in your society. And I really like that. Uh, yeah. My next question is slightly different though. Um, so I, when I watched India's Daughter, um, I saw that some of the people that you interviewed had very controversial opinions, like the lawyers, the rapists themselves. Um, how did you ensure that you kept your cool and got a 100% authentic answer? I'm sure it must not have been difficult to, uh, like it, it must have been very difficult to just, you know, be, keep your collected calm while they were saying things that kind of endangered you yourself in a way. Very, very good question, Sonika. And um, it was one of the biggest surprises I had in this whole process. Uh, I was absolutely sure that I would lose it with these rapists. Um, the one I came closest to losing it with was the uh, lawyer ML Sharma. Uh, literally, the sound guy had to come and put his hand on my shoulder just to remind me to calm down because... I was so angry with the sort of things he was saying. Uh, anyway, the thing is that the, the interesting, shocking thing for me was that when I was with interviewing those rapists for 31 hours, I didn't experience anger at all, at all, not one second of anger. And I was so sure that I would because at the age of 18, I was raped in South Africa, as it turns out. And um, I was so sure that sitting in front of rapists, all of that would, you know, come up and, and surface in me. And that although I've never lifted a finger to a human being in my life, I thought if there ever is a situation in which I might hit someone, this is the situation. So I better test myself. I better really check my degree of composure. And I asked the director general of the prison to allow me to practice. I know it sounds perverse, but I had to do it as a responsible filmmaker who needed my interviews for the film with the Nirbhaya rapists, the Jyoti Singh rapists, I needed also to, um, uh, to, to, to you know, test my own metal. And so I got permission to interview four other rapists who I was never going to use for my film, but would be a way of me. And one of those rapists had raped a five-year-old girl. And let me tell you, Sanika, in no case did I actually lose my cool because it was clear from the start these men had been programmed like robots. And in the same way as you can't get angry in that way with a robot because the robot has been programmed by somebody else, right? I just found anger not surprising. It wasn't appropriate. So that's the answer to one of, uh, part one of your question. And as to part two, how do I know I was getting authentic answers? Well, tragically, I can tell you, the answers were authentic because these men actually didn't believe they had done wrong. I know it's hard to swallow. I know it's hard to believe that. But believe me, I sat in front of these men and I can tell you that is the truth. They thought the wrongdoing had been done by Jyoti because one, she was out at night after dark, and they've been programmed by their socio-cultural thinking that a girl who's out after dark is a bad girl. She was with her boyfriend. That means she was a slut because she wasn't married to the guy. Therefore, 
as far as they were concerned, and they said this in so many words, not only did she deserve what she got, we had a duty to teach her a lesson. So there was no question of the answers being obfuscated or not, or not genuine because they didn't even think that they needed. That's why they were so honest, because they didn't think they had done wrong. Even the guy who raped the five-year-old, you know what his justification was? He, of course, didn't have the excuse that she was wearing a short skirt or had, had, was drunk or was out, you know, was a bad girl, a slut, a five-year-old little baby girl. His justification was, and he said word for word, word for word, this is what he said to me. He was a beggar girl. A life was of no value. That's what entitled him to do it. Who is culpable there? We are culpable for teaching him that a Dalit or a low caste girl or a beggar girl is worth the life of a, a gnat, a fly, a cockroach, a dog. That's We've taught him that. But what do you think was the reason you were very angry at what ML Sharma said, but you had no feelings for what the rapist said? Like, what do you think was the difference in the way you reacted to what they were saying? You know, it's a really good question, and I'm not sure I can answer that honestly. I can guess at it, and it, it may well be that I, I interviewed ML Sharma the most, really. Actually, no, Mukesh I interviewed the most, but outside of the rapists, he was the one I interviewed the most. I think I interviewed him for about 12 hours. And I think somehow, and it was after I had interviewed the rapists, and I think somehow it was just a buildup of the frustration of the shock of the realization of how an entire culture has taught these men how to think. And, you know, just feeling the, 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 the horror of how we women have suffered and continue to suffer as a result of this patriarchy. I think it just got too much because he was the one who was talking about patriarchal structures. He was the one who was saying, you know, in our culture, there is, there is no such place. There's no place for a woman. Those were his words. And he meant it. What he meant, of course, by woman is a woman who is sexual, a woman who is a full human being. There's no place for a woman. There's place for a wife. There's place for a daughter. There's place for a woman who is defined by her role in relation to men. But there's no place for an independent woman who is empowered and has her own voice, her own, you know, and I think it was just so blatant and so, and coming from him who should know better because of his so-called education. But you see, that's, that's why I think I lost it. But I think, to be honest, um, that was part of the journey for me. That's part of what made me understand this thing about education is the thing we need, but what kind of education, you know? Uh, it's not about access to education. We could get every single girl, boy, you know, there's still something like 60 or 70 million kids out of education. We could get every single one of them into education. We still won't change anything. We might change things for the labor market. Um, we'll change something for their lives. They'll become more empowered in some ways. But we're not going to change anything as far as you know, moving the needle on discrimination, on violence, on depression, on suicide. I think equal isn't only about that. Uh, you know, the, the sort of ending, disrupting discrimination and ending violence. I think equal also stops depression, which is the number two disease in the world. If you have no tools because you've never been taught or given the tools to deal with overwhelming feelings like sadness, anxiety, anger, how on earth are you expected to regulate those feelings. You can't without being taught it. Of course not. You know? It is the number one disease, or, or, or sorry, it's the number one cause of death amongst young men in the UK. Suicide. Think Equal stops that. It's about mental health. It's also about physical health. It is now proved beyond doubt that stress in early childhood is one of the direct predictors on a level with any other predictor of cardiovascular disease and diabetes oh. and cancer. Now, you know, we're a world that claims to love science and listen to the scientists. Well, let's wake up. Let's start listening to the scientists. That, that's right. And I think even for people um, who 
who've you know been trained under these patriarchal norms even people like me and you who grown up under these norms it takes so much active unlearning of what we've been taught since like the youngest of ages um the way we've been sexualized it takes like for me it took uh, when when the rape itself happened i was 12 um and it took so many years for me to come to this point and talk to you and it has taken so much unlearning for me to know that what happened to nirbha herself was not at all justified in any way but coming to justifications uh, the best part of the documentary for me personally was uh, when you read out i think all of uh, the damage that had been inflicted on her to mukesh um so do you think he showed uh, any remorse after that yeah. uh, there was no remorse at all there was a tiny bit of movement of his adam's apple and i was scrutinizing him like a hawk right i was watching every single you know my great hope as a filmmaker was that i would find some kind of you know regret i thought maybe one of the rapists would burst into tears while i interviewed him of course as a filmmaker you know you you want a myriad of reactions you imagine what they're going to none of it none of it the reason there was no remorse was they thought it wasn't their fault they didn't do wrong she had done wrong she deserved it so yeah okay so she sustained those injuries his response was well she shouldn't have fought back you know if she hadn't fought back uh she wouldn't have been so damaged i mean when being raped he said this is a direct quote when being raped a girl should just lie back and accept it Yeah. literally that's what they thought. like thought I, dead now you know they've carried out the penalty about a month ago they did but i also think that um for me personally um the case lost all its value um death penalty or not because it was prolonged for so long there i'm sure there were rapists and men with similar rape mentalities that thought you know if this is going to get dragged on for so long i might as well just commit the crime which is a terrible thing for an entire populist to think correct many of them yeah um so i've come to the last question for our interview and it is um i i we did talk about how think equal was a direct result of your work on the documentary but what effect uh what impact do you think the documentary had on the world as a whole um i i do know it had there was a lot of shocked response in india but what do you think the impact was it of of it in the world in general do you think it caused people to change their mindset to at least look at the um you know problem deeper because i know there's a lot of um you know uh, art inspired from the documentary in itself we recently had a uh, delhi crime which is a show on the entire incident come out um so many uh, people have started writing books uh, talk, started talking about it in mainstream media so what do you think was the impact of the documentary i i think the documentary had a a limited but um worthwhile effect in that i mean remember this was pre me too this was pre you know the um uh violence against women movement having any real kind of traction and i think it gave it that i think it did motor the conversation and spark something of a movement but saying that i really don't want anyone to think that's an achievement it's not an achievement it's not something i'm proud of at all because it changes nothing and this is why i've left filmmaking i cannot look myself in the mirror and turn my attention now to another subject i cannot having understood how we can tackle this as its root just be content with building a movement or creating awareness or sparking a conversation even though yes that may have not changed necessarily but it may have jogged jiggled a few people i know that i had emails from um particularly indian men uh, perhaps not surprisingly who wrote to me and said i need your help in in understanding something i am i promise you believe me take it from me i'm a decent man uh i respect women i've never lifted a finger to a woman in my life i wouldn't dream of doing that and yet watching the documentary i recognize those attitudes 
as being my attitudes. How can this be? How, what is actually going on here? So, you know, the fact that it made people really examine themselves is even more valuable than making people talk about it amongst themselves. It, it's of some value to have done that. Yes, I'm pleased it did that. I'm not proud because it changes nothing. And the only thing I'll ever be proud of is actual, concrete, tangible change. It's enough now of measuring the problem endlessly, of writing endless reports about the problem, of creating more awareness, of hosting more conferences. We know the problem inside out. We know what it is, and we know how to tackle it, and we know how to cure it. And we should be damned if we don't get up off our asses and take those steps and do it. That's it. There's nothing else for it. Practical steps and practical action. Think equal. That's perfect. Um, so thank you so much for answering all my questions. To all my viewers, I would uh, recommend you go check out the Think Equal website, read into what they say, and um, please donate if you can. It's a great cause. I am personally very uh, motivated by the cause. And um, yeah, thank you so much for doing this with me.